tonight. The city is sending an advocacy group to Victoria to get more meaningful discussion time with ministers. Plus, the only Prince George doctor involved with the Provincial Retinal Disease Program is stepping out of it. And the Immigrant and Multicultural Services Society will be celebrating Asian Heritage on Friday ahead of Asian Heritage Month. Good evening, folks. I'm Eddie Huband, and welcome to CKPG News. We begin tonight in politics with a story involving both local and provincial levels. Prince George City Council feels there's limited opportunity for FaceTime with ministers to discuss various issues. As such, they're planning on sending an advocacy group to Victoria for a series of meetings as a way to get the ball rolling for things they want to address within municipal limits. Cheryl Jan brings us our top story. Members of council typically get some airtime with ministers during events like the Union of BC Municipalities Convention, but that time is very limited, tantamount to speed dating, with hundreds of other municipal representatives vying for the ear of one minister or another. When we go to UBCM and NCLGA, it's a great way to find common problems that municipalities throughout the north face or municipalities all across BC face, and then we can line up one or two or three things and hit really hard with lots of voices all at the same time. That's really effective. But at UBCM, when we get our one-on-one -on -one time for the city, it's, it's short and it's amongst many, many other municipalities. So council plans to send a delegation to Victoria to meet with the likes of the Minister of Emergency Management and Climate Readiness and the Minister of Housing. Well, we're always open to talk to Mayor and Council. The Premier was in Prince George just recently and met with Mayor and Council, had a discussion about a whole, whole list of topics. Uh, and, uh, of course, our door is always open. Uh, if the schedules permit, uh, I'd be happy to meet with uh, mayor and council and whoever comes part of their delegation. By going from Prince George all the way down to the ministers on their home ground, it's going to be an opportunity for us to, to step out of the big group and say, look, it's really important, it's so important that we sent a group of people down. You're not just going to hear it through our UBCM rep, because Councillor Ramsey is our UBCM rep. You're not just going to hear it through Mayor Yu. Mayor Yu is our rep on the BC Urban Mayors Coalition. But you're also going to have intergovernmental come down. And we've got that three-way punch of reminding them from the UBCM side, from the mayor side, and from the intergovernmental side that we've got some issues that are unique to Prince George. And this is one of the issues top of mind for council housing, but that's not all. Well, we know that, that, that housing, mental health and addictions, all of the uh, connected issues around homelessness uh, and some reconciliation, all of those seem like they're issues that you can pull apart and put into separate silos, but really we've got issues that we, we've got to talk about there. We know Prince George is not immune to the challenges being felt by many when it comes to housing. Uh, and I think if uh, Prince George Council is keen to have that conversation, I'd be happy to meet with them to talk about it. The aim is for the delegation to head down to Victoria for this blitz of meetings in April. Cheryl Jan, CKPG News. Meanwhile, in federal politics, Skeena Bulkley Valley MP Taylor Backrack sits on the Federal Transport Committee and he had a chance to hear from Air Canada CEO about the current issues that Canadian airlines are facing when it comes to the treatment of persons with disabilities. Here's what Backrack had to say. We've now heard from both WestJet and Air Canada at the committee. Uh, both companies are, are doing things related to the accessibility of their services. But the questions really remain uh, whether they would support stronger federal regulations. And ultimately, the buck stops with the transport minister. It's the minister who's responsible for ensuring that all Canadian travelers are treated fairly and uh, have their dignity upheld. It was disappointing to hear the CEO of Air Canada, like the folks from WestJet at a previous meeting, uh, really portray the numbers in a way that diminishes the problem. They, they claim that they fly you know, hundreds of thousands of people uh, with disabilities and that the complaints they receive are only a tiny, tiny fraction of that. Um, I, I think that's the wrong approach. Uh, what we need is for these companies to admit that this is a big problem. And uh, we bring Adam Burles now to uh, follow up on this interesting, uh, interesting little mm -hmm. piece right there with with Taylor Backrack. So we just heard from him. So what are the next steps with, with addressing this issue, Adam? Because airlines have been a pretty contentious topic for Canadians for the last couple of years now. Right. So the obviously the first 
major step would be legislation. Getting a formal bill through the House, permanently legislated, and having something enshrined in law. That's the first step, so that way passengers with disabilities have protected rights, that nothing can be changed with that. Mm -hmm. um, because right now there, there's a lot of fluidity with this. There's not a lot that the airlines will only do something if pressure is put on them, as was the case when a number of stories were put out there. With right, we, we, had, we had one here with Rodney the Prince, Hodgins, yes. a Prince George man, had, right, to, in drag Las Vegas, had right. to drag himself off an Air Canada plane in Las Vegas. Yeah. That kind of sparked the domino effect. More people came forward saying, I, I had this issue too with Air Canada, with WestJet. So when that happened, that put some pressure on the airlines to finally say, hey, we, maybe we should do something here. But of course, it also sparked discussions within with government officials, the discussion with the Transportation Committee, with Air Canada's CEO and WestJet um, leadership. But again, nothing's going to change unless you know legislation is put forward because that will permanently protect persons with disabilities when they get on a plane in Canada. And it, it speaks to, to me, it speaks to a bigger issue about accountability with these airlines in Canada. Accountability because we only have two major airlines really. Right. Um, yeah. So there's a big, a lot of, not a lot of no, competition. They, can, they yeah. feel like they can do a lot, so. It's another can of worms, but uh, you know, in other federal politics news I wanted to touch on, the opposition took another big swing at the Trudeau government over mm -hmm. carbon tax. This is really starting to heat up. Yes, carbon tax increase is set to come into effect on April 1st. Federal Conservative leader Pierre Polyev um, announced today that he was going to hold a motion in the House today to get the government to scrap the carbon tax increase. That motion failed. Um, of course, the Bloc Québécois and the NDP um, sided with the Liberal government on this. But what's more interesting now is that this is going to lead to a non-confidence motion. Pierre Pauly has said that if this motion today failed, he would introduce a non-confidence motion, which means that it is a binding motion that if the government loses that motion, the government can fall and an election has to be called. So... But how likely is that to happen? Well, the thing is, if you have the NDP, the Liberal government has the NDP votes. Right. So in order, something drastic would have to happen in order for the NDP and for the Bloc Québécois to switch their votes to vote with the Conservatives. So, so it's very uh, unlikely, essentially. Unlikely to happen at this juncture right. um, with the NDP providing those confidence and supply votes right now. So unlikely, but it's still major development in the carbon tax uh, debate. And all leading government. up to that federal election. Leading uh, up to the 2025 federal election. Yeah. All right, Adam Burles, thank you very much for your insight as thank always. You. We'll shift to medical news now. The Provincial Retinal Disease Program provides access to medication that prevents blindness at no cost to the patient. But when it was announced that the only doctor in Prince George that is involved with the program will be stepping out of it, his patients could be left to foot the bill themselves. Sam Benison has the story. In 2019, Bill Henry was diagnosed with wet age-related macular degeneration, a chronic condition that if not treated by a doctor will result in him going blind. He said, we have a, an injection that is having a lot of success with a lot of people. And he reiterated many times, it's not a cure, but it has had an effect in prolonging your vision and preserving it. There was a pocket that had opened up in the retina and over the four years I've had injections, that the bleeding stopped, but the pocket started shrinking. Unfortunately, the specialist who performs the procedure in Prince George withdrew from the program as of March 31st, citing an alleged 32% reduction in compensation to retinal specialists participating in the program. Now, the doctor's patients, including Bill, will either have to pay for treatment or find a new doctor. I'm already almost maxed out on what I can afford each month medically. While neither the doctor or the Provincial Health Services Authority were able to provide CKPG an interview, the Provincial Health Services Authority released a statement affirming their commitment to those who rely on the program. Stating that while discussions about the program delivery continue, certain key aspects will not change. Care for those patients will continue, and second, the program will continue to offer the same drug coverage to patients for specialists to access on their behalf. Unfortunately, as it currently stands, the nearest specialists who are part of the program are in Fort St. John and Kamloops, and for Bill, the monthly travel would max out his budget. So I would have to find a way to go to Kamloops. I can't drive six hours down there and then accommodation and then drive back and... Uh, 
So it, it, it becomes more and more financially unfeasible for me. And as Bill Henry waits for his next appointment, the question remains, will he get the help he needs before his eyesight fails him? I will go blind. I, I don't know how long it'll take. It could be quick. It could be um, a drawn out thing, but the cloudiness will come back. Sam Benison, CKPG News. A quick note, a Category 2 and 3 open burning ban is coming to the Prince George Fire Center. It will go into effect at noon on March 28th and will cover the entire fire center. A number of activities and equipment will be banned, including fireworks, sky lanterns, burn barrels, and binary explosion targets. This prohibition does not include campfires that are half a meter by half a meter wide or smaller. The BC Wildfire Service says multiple factors are taken into consideration when assessing wildfire hazards, including drought conditions and current and forecasted weather. Some sad news for the community of Prince George now. Jack Hooper, an all too familiar character in the city, has passed away at age 83. Hooper was most noted for his work with Crime Stoppers, of which he was a staunch supporter, pushing to have the Prince George branch of the organization expanded to all of Northern BC. And it has courtesy of Jack's determination. Councillor Ron Palillo worked closely with him and had this to say about his passing. Because of Jack in a lot of ways and his determination and his hard work and, and really his leadership, um, Crime Stoppers is now a northern BC Crime Stoppers that serves two thirds of the province. And it was that that grit and determination, and he wouldn't take no for an answer. The other thing that I knew of him, not only was he dedicated to Crime Stoppers, but also junior achievement and mentoring young people to be successful business leaders. That was very important to him as well, too. So he indeed was a force to reckon with, yeah. Asian Heritage Month, Month takes place in May, but the Immigrant and Multicultural Services Society in Prince George will be celebrating Asian heritage this upcoming Friday. And it's an opportunity for the whole community to celebrate history, legacy, and the contributions of Asians in Prince George and the North. Adam Burles has more. The Immigrant and Multicultural Services Society, or IMSS, is hosting a Celebrating Asian Heritage event for the community this Friday to celebrate their cultures and their contributions to our community. Asian Heritage Month is um, the celebration of Asian people who come to Canada. And we are celebrating their cultures, we are celebrating their diversity, uh, we are celebrating their contribution to the Canadian government and uh, in economy also. This is the first time that the IMSS is hosting the event after receiving funding from Heritage Canada. There will also be a ticketed gala following the main festival. We are going to have exhibitors, cultural exhibitors, and then performances, entertainment, and it's a family event. A lot of activities for all the family. The history and heritage of different Asian cultures and Prince George goes back a long time, and part of that history is present at the Exploration Place, whose CEO admits that more stories need to be told. There's so many different groups that contributed to the development of this part of the world after contact, and we don't know the story really of any of them, so we're looking to connect. Artifacts that have come into the museum over the years can shed a whole new light on untold stories. You know, I think it's important that we don't try and tell another group's story. Um, people need to see themselves in our cultural facilities and they need to tell their own stories. All somebody knew in the 70s when it came in was that it was Asian or Chinese or something and so they went with, ah, oh, must be a teapot. But it isn't. And that's where getting people involved in telling their own stories is how we're actually going to get the right stories. And people are going to see themselves in the development of these communities across Canada. If you would like more information on the Celebrating Asian Heritage Festival, you can visit imss.ca. Adam Burles, CKPG News. Over 1,300 performers are in the northern capital this week for the biggest Prince George dance festival in its 48-year history. And as Dave Branco tells us now, they traveled far and wide to be here. He met some of the dancers showcasing their talents at Vanier Hall and brings us this story. Performers from as far north as the Yukon as far south as Vancouver and places in between appear in Vanya Hall stage every three minutes to try to capture the adjudicator's attention. In fact, we had to extend our festival by essentially a day and a half 
to accommodate all those entries and we have more than 500 individual dancers participating in those 1300 entries. So. A dance festival usually consists of performances by different dance companies and showcases various dance styles. And we actually do a kind of unique scheduling for our festival where we have two adjudicators at any given time um, and they're each adjudicating alternative dance disciplines so we can go really quickly because while one dance is on stage being adjudicated, the other adjudicator has a moment to collect their thoughts, give the score and provide the feedback. Dance festivals are essential cultural events promoting dance appreciation, supporting emerging talent and encouraging collaboration among dancers. Being a part of this festival helps your technique grow with the feedback that you get with the adjudicators, with watching other performers. Jacob began dancing at a young age, and performing in front of an audience is one of their biggest motivations. Generally, as a dancer, you're not here for the money. You're here to have the experience and everything, but getting the money if you place is great. At the end of the nine-day dance event, organizers will award $27,000 worth of scholarships and prizes, and 20 competitors will advance to the provincial competition this year. Dave Branco, CKPG News. As of this morning, the lowest gas price in Prince George was sitting at $1.55.9 per litre at Costco. The lowest price in the province right now was in Salmon Arm at $1.54.9 per litre. Manitoba has the lowest fuel prices on average in the country at $1.37.3 per litre, while BC has an average price of $1.84.3 per litre. CKPG Sports is delivered by Domino's. Feed your team tonight with a delicious mix and match combo. Chicken, pizza, pasta or dessert for just $8.99 per item. The Prince George Cougars have certainly enjoyed great success this season, and with that comes more attendance numbers and Cougars merchandise flying off the shelves. Anthony Correa brings us the details of the hot team in Prince George. The Prince George Cougars have had a really exciting year on the ice, but what about off the ice? Well, in the eyes of Director of Business Taylor Dakers, it's been just as successful. You know, as the season's gone on, you know, we've, we've gauged, or gained more interest with people, and you know, the numbers have come up and, uh, you know, let's just say they're much higher than they were last year, which was much higher than they were the year before. And, you know, we're actually, uh, you know, we're doing pretty good compared to pre-COVID numbers as well. So It's no surprise. In their 30th season, the Prince George Cougars see themselves as one of the most successful junior hockey teams in Canada. With success comes fans, and the players love that aspect of the game the most. Um, this year it's been, you know, special. and. Um, a lot of good, really good crowds, and you know, it just uh, yeah, it really helps us from all the guys. It's uh, you know, super helpful, and uh, yeah, just when you're down a goal or whatever to you know bring that and you hear that, you just want to win for your your uh, you know city. So it's uh, pretty cool to have their support out, and yeah, we're not going to disappoint them. With playoffs just around the corner, the Cougars team store has revealed some new merchandise that will be available to fans this weekend. And just like the seats, it seems to be full of fans whenever they get the chance to check it out. Along with the tickets, another big boost to the team's success off the ice. Um, financially, yes, it's been a really good year for us um, compared to previous years. Um, you know, there's been a lot of down years for this team uh, on the ice and that's in the office as well. So we're happy to, to be able to take a step forward on that side. This Saturday is retro night and with tickets already selling quick, it should be a special one both on and off the ice to close out the year with Prince George really embracing the saying, there's no place like home. You go to the road and maybe there's four or 5,000, there's still not the same energy. Um, I don't know what it is, but the Northerners bring a little extra. So it's, it's fun to see. And you know, hopefully this Saturday, especially with the retro night jerseys, everybody wants to see them, you know, kind of set the tone for playoffs to get uh, a full house and exciting atmosphere here in the CN. The TSX is up 185 points to close at 22,046. The Dow Jones is up 401 points to close at 39,512. And Artemis Gold went up 3 cents to close at $7.46.
Good evening again, everyone. We are in for a pretty nice weather pattern the next several days. Lots of sunshine. The only difference really is the cooler air that's now moved in. So starting to see the temperatures drop as the days go on. Today wasn't too bad and of course uh, it's mainly cloudy to start, but some clearing through the afternoon in many cases. Tomorrow we should be under mainly sunny skies. This is the satellite taking you back with some of that cloud cover hanging around, but nothing like many areas of Alberta and, and eastern BC are seeing. We can see the future cast shows you all that action with all the snow that's falling uh, down through southern Alberta and even up through uh, parts of the central and northern half as well seeing that but not so much as heavy as it is down through the southern with snowfall warnings in through Calgary today and some of that coming in towards eastern BC but future cast for us shows some really nice weather beautiful sunshine and that's going to hold strong right through the week we are going to see a dip in temperatures though down to uh, closer to average for the most part maybe a bit below in some areas, but certainly it will be a cooler and clearer trend going forward. So seven degrees are high tomorrow, very similar to what we saw today. Sun cloud mix, though, beautiful by the afternoon with mainly sunny skies. Up in the piece, it's certainly getting cooler with that air coming in. Not quite as much snow tomorrow expected in Fort St. John, but still you do have the instability hanging around. It'll be low-lying cloud east of Vailmount, but no more snow for tomorrow. Four degrees, 13 Kelowna, Vancouver as well. Lots and lots of cloud cover down through the southern half half of the province. So we're not quite seeing as much uh, cloud cover as uh, southern BC is seeing, but we are seeing some cooler temperatures uh, as we move forward. We'll be in and around plus one, plus two in some cases throughout the region going forward. That is the case in Mackenzie. Two degrees tomorrow, seven Vanderhoof, Burns Lake sitting around the same. It is going to be drier down through Quinell and McBride tomorrow. And this is a snapshot of the country so you can see that uh, the province of Alberta really getting hit hard with some snow. Edmonton minus three tomorrow with snow and seeing that uh, likely the case down through uh, the southern half of that province as well. And even in towards Regina. Minus three is going to be the temperature with some snow falling there. It is cloudy but dry in Winnipeg and further east much cooler as well. Very unsettled over towards the Maritimes as well, as well with the wintry mix expected in many areas including Halifax and St. John. So sunny sky for our weekend. It's really sunny as we move through the rest of our work week as well though uh, but certainly not quite as warm as it has been. So you can see where that jet stream has pushed further south so that's allowing some of that cooler air to come in and to settle in and you'll see the dip in temperatures as we move forward. Burns Lake about minus about plus three rather uh, it will be the coolest of the bunch but overnight lows are certainly going to be chillier minus 12 tonight minus 10 in McKenzie tonight plus two tomorrow with partly sunny skies and then lots and lots of sunshine for the weekend Friday especially but only plus one for your daytime high. Extended forecast in McBride, uh, minus five tonight, up to about three for the next couple of days. Mostly cloudy tomorrow with a few sunny breaks, mostly sunny for Friday, Saturday, and even into Sunday. We won't look ahead too far, but yes, Monday or early next week, things could change up just a little bit. Not just uh, there, but in many areas around our broadcast region. Nine degrees with mostly cloud cover in Quinell tomorrow. You are going to see a few sunny breaks, though, going forward, and it's a pretty nice forecast for us. Plenty of sunshine going forward. Cool down a little bit more than what you see here but uh, definitely uh, still very very bearable with the beautiful sunshine out there for the rest of the week and the weekend. CKPG Sports is delivered by Domino's. Feed your team tonight with a delicious mix and match combo. Chicken, pizza, pasta or dessert for just $8.99 per item. Though the, Sprint, though, though the Prince George Spruce Kings split last weekend with the Merritt Centennials, Scott Cousins performed up to task as he was named BCHL First Star of the Week. The Prince George product started his team's back-to-back -back home set against Centennials by scoring two goals in Friday night's 6-3 loss. The forward then followed it up with a goal and two assists in a 4-3 overtime win the next night. In total, Cousins posted three goals and two assists, good for five points over the weekend, bringing his total to 19 points on the season. Yeah, it's exciting. It's a, it's a big accomplishment. I'm proud of it, and I, I think I owe a good chunk of that to my line mates this weekend. We were clicking uh, pretty well. so I thought we played all right in the, in the Friday game, and game kind of got away from us, and then we are on the outside, and uh, I think we did a good job of kind of changing that in, uh, in Saturday and not allowing that game to get away from us and uh, battling back to get the win. 
even though there's still four games to go in the Kings season, they have been locked into their first round postseason opponent for the BCHL playoffs. The team will take on the first place Penticton V's as the eighth seed with games one and two set for April 5th and 6th, taking place at the South Okanagan Center. Then it's right back to Prince George for games three and four on April 9th and April 10th. Tickets are on sale online and in the box office. It will be a David versus Goliath type matchup, but the team isn't backing down from the challenge of facing the top team in the BCHL. I think there are definitely benefits of knowing who you're playing because we have a lot more time to prepare and you know we'll know what to expect. We'll have a few weeks of, of watching a video about them and practicing to play against a team like that. So yeah, I think it's a good thing. Yeah, no, they're a tough opponent, but uh, I think we've been knowing that we might play them for a, a bit now, so we'll be prepared and ready for what they bring. Well, it's March, so you know that means bring on a March Madness. That's right, the biggest tournament in college sports tips off tomorrow morning. And to get you excited, we relive some of the top March Madness moments in recent history all in tonight's CKP3. Loyola Chicago kicks off this countdown. One time out, they don't take it. This buzzer beater in round one of the 2018 tournament was the perfect start. They would go on to the final four as an 11 seed in a legendary March run. Next, an all-time bracket buster. Looking for Edie, of course. Knocked away, great defense by Moore. He gets it back, Moore flies in and scores! Moore straight away three. It's good! Now Smith. Smith drives, rejected! Oh, FD, you believe it! For just the second time ever, a 16 beats a 1! Flashback to 2023, where Fairleigh Dickinson University shocked the basketball world, upsetting number one seeded Purdue. Only the second time in tournament history it's happened. Finally, just an iconic shot. Diakono, three seconds at midcourt. Jenkins gives it to Jenkins for the championship. <laughs> the national champions with Jenkins hitting the winner at the buzzer. 2016 Villanova versus UNC. It's Chris Jenkins taking the final shot, winning the national title at the buzzer, and one of the most iconic shots in basketball history takes top spot in tonight's CKP3. That's all for now, folks. Thanks for joining us as always. And your last look tonight is, uh, <laughs> it's a box of waddles at Exploration Place. How cute. Have a great night. We'll see you tomorrow.